All right. Hello and welcome. I'm going to give folks just a moment or two to join us in our webinar, but I am so, so, so glad to see you are all here with us today. So we'll just, uh, we'll get started in about one minute. All right, uh, so we'll go ahead and get started. Um, hello and welcome and thank you all so much for joining us today for Westchester University's first annual Gender Justice Conference keynote event. My name is Tess Benzer. I use they, them, theirs pronouns. I'm the Assistant Director of Outreach and Engagement for the WCU Center for Women and Gender Equity and the Chair of the 2021 Gender Justice Conference Committee at Westchester. I am so thrilled to welcome you on behalf of the Gender Justice Conference Planning Committee, the Center for Women and Gender Equity, and Westchester University. We're super honored to have participants from the Westchester community, um, as well as participants from across the country joining us for this inaugural conference and for our keynote event. So thank you so much. Um, we're really excited to be hosting Dr. Hirsch and Khan this afternoon. Their book, Sexual Citizens, has offered some very powerful new concepts to help explain the sexual experiences of young adults. And we are just thrilled to have them here. Uh, the Gender Justice Conference Planning Committee is also pleased to announce that the first 75 Westchester University students who registered today will receive a copy of Sexual Citizens. So if you have not yet had a chance to register, um, we will put the registration link in the chat. Please make sure you register so you can receive that free copy of the book. All right, so just a few more things before we get into the keynote. Um, I wanted to offer a brief content warning for this session. Um, we at the Center for Women and Gender Equity, as well as the Conference Planning Committee, support the course of healing that each individual takes after having experienced harm. And we are committed to creating a safe virtual space where our audience members feel supported upon entering. Um, in today's presentation, we may discuss topics around consent. Um, so this may include conversations around sexual violence and harm, intimate partner violence, dating violence or relationship violence, gender-based violence and harm, misogyny, racism, racist violence and harm, and um, also possibly examples of homophobia, biphobia, and anti-LGBTQ harm. Um, we understand that engaging in this content can be potentially triggering or activating for our audience members, so we invite you to take care of yourself during the presentation. Please feel free to take a break, step away, turn your, your sound off at any point, um, and really just uh, take a moment to honor your feelings around these topics. Um, just really quickly, I want to briefly offer our thanks to our partners in uh, making this uh, session possible. Uh, thank you so much to the Center for Trans and Queer Advocacy, the Dowdy Multicultural Center, the Center for Civic Engagement and Social Impact, the Office of New Student Programs, the Office of Student Leadership and Involvement, Westchester University's Parent and Family Relations, the Office of Diversity, Equity and Inclusion, and her campus at Westchester. I would also like to say thank you so much to Jay Wexler and Joy Harris, our ASL interpreters for today, and offer a thank you to the company Deaf Interpreting for providing live captioning for today's session. Uh, before we introduce our speakers for the keynote, I would like to take a moment to introduce Dr. Sandy Alcedonis, who is the Senior Director of the Center for Women and Gender Equity, for a few opening remarks. Thank you, Tess. Good afternoon. My name is Dr. Cindy Gaya Alcedonis, and I want to thank everyone for joining us today. Today, we join our voices with so many in pain and outrage at the killing of eight people, six of them Asian women, at three Atlanta area spas last week. We grieve the loss of lives and invite everyone to keep the loved ones of these people and their communities in your hearts. We understand and situate these murders within the context of a long history of racism that is both structural and interpersonal. In the past 12 months alone, more than 3,700 anti-Asian hate incidents have been reported, 
a majority of these incidents reported by women. As documented in Sexual Citizens, the text authored by our keynote speakers, Hirsch and Khan, and in the lived experiences of people all over our country, understanding the intersection of race and gender is crucial in our fight to prevent sexual assault, gender-based violence, and all forms of oppression. Kimberly Crenshaw, writing in response to these horrific events last week, reminds us of the urgency to develop and address the lethality of intersectional vulner vulnerability. Crenshaw goes on, to, goes on to remind us that intersectional vulnerabilities are not simplistic claims about identities, but rather that they are ex explanations of the multiple dynamics and root causes of these killings, misogyny, racism, and economic precarity. These root causes are only further entrenched by the erasure of certain dimensions of this violence. Today, we pause in solidarity to wrestle with that. And as we seek ways to one, support those who've been intentionally maligned and made unsafe by the reinvigoration of anti-Asian racism, and two, to disrupt this legacy and present day manifestations of white supremacist and misogynistic violence. With that, we invite and encourage all participants here right now to remain on this webinar at 1.30. Dr. Justin Sprague will join us to share his incredibly moving and powerful narrative essay, Learning to Shout. I will return briefly at the conclusion of the keynote to introduce Dr. Sprague. We hope you will join us for that and the entire conference experience today and tomorrow. Thank you again for joining us. We are honored by your presence. At this point, I'll turn it back to Tess to introduce the presenters for this session. Thank you again. Thank you so much, Sandy, for those very powerful words. I am thrilled to be able to introduce our, our panelists today. I'm going to begin um, to introduce by introducing our two peer educators from the Center for Women and Gender Equity who will kick off this keynote. Um, so please allow me to introduce Dana Pfeiffer. Dana is a senior psychology major in the, with a women's and gender studies minor. She is a peer educator at the Center for Women and Gender Equity. Dana is part of PSYCHI, the International Honor Society for Psychology and TRIOTA, the Honor Society for Women and Gender Studies. Uh, our other presenter today, Sasha Alvarado is a third year political science major with a minor in Spanish. Sasha is a peer educator at the Center for Women and Gender Equity, as well as the co-president of Planned Parenthood Generation Action and the secretary for the Association of Women's Empowerment. Together, Dana and Sasha work to write, record, and produce the Center for Women and Gender Equity's podcast, Exploring Entanglements. Exploring Entanglements is a podcast devoted to exploring how students can learn to keep each other safe and build respect for fulfilling relationships. This podcast uses the text of sexual citizens by our speakers today. Um, to understand where sex education needs to change and adapt to serve college students and their needs with the goal of keeping everyone safe. Please join me in welcoming Sasha and Dana. Thank you so much, Tess. Um, we are very excited for the opportunity that we have to join our guests, Dr. Jennifer Hirsch and Dr. Seamus Khan today. Now we have the honor of introducing them. So first, I'd like to introduce Jennifer S. Hirsch. Um, Jennifer is a professor of social medical sciences at the Mailman School of Public Health at Columbia University. Her research spans five um, intertwined domains, the anthropology of love, gender, sexuality, and migration, sexual, reproductive, and HIV risk practices, social scientific research on sexual assault and undergraduate well-being, and the intersections between anthropology and public health. She is one of New York's New York City's 16 heroes in a fight against gender-based violence. And in 2012, she was selected as a, ooh, I'm not sure how to say that, Guggenheim Fellow. And I have the honor of introducing Dr. Seamus Khan. Seamus is a professor of sociology and American studies at Princeton University. He is the author of dozens of books and articles on inequality, American culture, gender, and elites. His work has appeared in the New Yorker, the New York Times, the Washington Post, CNN, and many other media outlets. In 2018, he was awarded the Hans L. Zetterberg Prize for the best sociologist under 40, and you can read more of his work at SeamusKhan.com. So we are so thrilled to have him here with us today to share more about the research and its implications on our campus and other campuses as well to create a safer environment 
for all of us. So please join us in welcoming Dr. Jennifer Hirsch and Dr. Seamus Khan. We're so happy to be here. Thank you. We feel very welcomed. So I think maybe we'll start off um, just giving a little bit of a sense of um, why we wrote the book to, to begin our conversation. Um, and I'm gonna begin with a story and I just wanna underline the, the, the content warning. Um, the book is very narrative driven. And so in the course of our conversation, we're gonna be sharing uh, descriptions of actual sexual assaults as students experience them. Um, just, we know that there are survivors in every room. Please take care of yourselves. Um, so uh, Lucy, when she arrived on campus, um, had been pretty sheltered in high school. She went to boarding school, she hadn't had a boyfriend, and she was clear about the kinds of social experiences that she was looking forward to. She wanted to meet some boys, um, make out, and eventually lose her virginity. And so it felt super exciting. Her friend Nancy, who lived on the same hall as she did, um, asked her if she wanted to go to one of the neighborhood bars during orientation week. And um, she did, so they went to a bar. They were under the legal drinking age, but not a problem to get in. Um, and uh, they met some seniors. And again, super exciting to have these older guys, you know, come chat them up. Um, Scott bought Lucy uh, a drink, they danced. Um, he asked if she wanted to come back to the fraternity. She did. So she walked back up Amsterdam Avenue with him, um, her phone was ringing. Uh, it turned out it was Nancy, her friend, who was trying to catch up with her and make sure she was okay. Nancy had gotten that bystander intervention um, and was trying to, to be a, a good friend. Um, Scott didn't really want to wait for Nancy, but he agreed to. And so they, they waited outside the fraternity when Nancy caught up, they went inside. Um, he asked the girls if they wanted some drinks. Uh, fraternities, as you probably know, aren't allowed, at least on the Columbia campus, aren't allowed to serve hard alcohol. Doesn't mean they don't do it. It just means that they keep it upstairs. And so um, Scott and Lucy and Nancy went up to the second floor, just pause to picture the scene. The second floor of a house that Scott lived in, surrounded by his friends on a campus he'd been on for three years, um, and a campus to which Lucy and Nancy were both uh, very much newcomers. Um, Nancy passed out pretty much right away after taking the first sip of her drink and Scott asked Lucy if she wanted to go up to his room and she did. So she went upstairs, they went upstairs together um, and they were making out and then he started to un unbutton her pants and she said to him, she said, no, don't, to which he said, it's okay. But it wasn't okay because then he raped her. Um, and she had never told anyone that story in that way, the way she told it to us as a sexual assault. When she shared it the next day with her um, freshman year roommates, she recounted it as like a crazy orientation week thing that just happened um, and not necessarily bad. Um, and, you know, your take, it's, it's a hard story to tell. I know it's a hard story to listen to. And your take in hearing it might be Scott is a terrible person. And that's not a bad take, um, but if that's the only response you have, that doesn't necessarily lead us to a roadmap for change. And so that's why we, we did the research on which Sexual Citizens is based, um, is to begin to map out that, that path for change. Um, uh, in 2014, when uh, Claude Mellons and I began the Sexual Health Initiative to Foster Transformation, which was this gigantic uh, research project funded by Columbia, most of the conversation was about um, adjudication. And student activists like you were working hard, um, assisted uh, in solidarity with the, with the federal government that was trying to uh, change adjudication processes to make them uh, more responsive to the needs of people who had experienced sexual harm. Very important work, um, but only a tiny proportion of assaults are ever reported, much less adjudicated. And so that's not going to prevent the assaults. And to the extent that there was a conversation about prevention, 
um, it was focused on this idea of people who cause sexual harm um, as sort of sociopathic perpetrators. It was when the movie The Hunting Ground came out and there was sort of, if we can identify the bad apples and get them off our campus, then we'll be safe. Um, and we make a radically different argument in sexual citizens, which is that sexual assault is a predictable consequence of how society is organized, which is kind of grim to see how sexual assault is actually built into the campus experience, but also, and I think this is the feeling of, of reading the book is ultimately hopeful because once we identify how it's built into the campus env environment, we can begin to have a conversation, this conversation we're having today about how we can design it out and not just design it out of a campus experience, but design it out more broadly of, of the social world uh, that we live in. So that's, that's the big picture of sexual citizens. Um, do you, are you are we going to be in conversation or Seamus and I will just talk? We can. Um, whatever you want to do, we do have questions. Um, but yeah. whatever, okay. okay. No, please, please go ahead. I'll start with the first question. Um, so would you be able to just tell us a little bit more about the shift study and like why you decided to write sexual citizens? Like what were like your motivators for the study as well as the book? Sure. So as as Jennifer um, just outlined, you know, the, the big motivation was sort of immodestly to change the national conversation, to pivot us away from questions of adjudication and what to do after assaults happened, and instead to focus on modifiable aspects of the campus environment that would allow us to hopefully prevent campus sexual assault. And by like modifiable aspects of the campus environment, I mean, that sort of is a, it's a very academic phrase. It's like, how are our communities organized and why do they make, why does that organization make assault so predictable? So, you know, if we thought that assaults were just the product of like bad people, it, you know, the organization of our communities may not matter that much, except in how we raise people to be bad. Um, and you know, in, instead, Jennifer and I are kind of interested in that in that second part. Like, why is it that things like assault are predictable? What is it about how we're organizing the, our education of young people before they ever arrive to college, their family environments, um, you know, the campus environment, in such a way that assault is likely? And how do we make it less likely? So let me just take a moment to describe the broader research project um, uh, that this is based upon. So, you know, we're part of, uh, uh, Jennifer, as she said, co-led shift with Claudine Mellons. Um, and we're part of a team of like 30 people who dedicated more than two years um, to studying sexual assault on Columbia and Barnard's campus, and really five years. So if you look at like the planning and the analysis portion, and those 30 people did a bunch of different studies. There was a survey component to our research, which um, Claude Mellons led, which included surveying uh, 2,500 students. Um, and we had a response rate of 67%. And for the students who are listening along, like response rates matter for surveys. Um, and uh, most sexual experience uh, surveys have response rates of about 25%. So they're missing the vast majority of the people. We were lucky and also deliberate in our design of trying to reach many more people. And that was something that helped us get a portrait of like, you know, what is the average experience that people are having? How typical is the experience of sexual assault? And we found things that, you know, were consistent with the broader literature, but deeply troubling about how students who had difficulty paying for basic needs and their necessities were more likely to experience assault, how the LGBTQIA community experienced some of the highest rates of assault. Um, and that sort of, that gave us a, a description of what was happening. And then the part of the research that Jennifer and I co-led, the ethnography sought to dig deep into the lived experiences of students. And we did that in three ways. First, we interviewed 151 students. We spent two hours with all of them talking about their lives before college and then in college, experiences with their family, with sex and intimacy, with substance use, and with sexual assault. 
And so we, we sort of did these kind of life histories to that point of these young people. For some of them, they had so many stories to tell us about um, uh, difficult sexual experiences or sexual violence that we did up to two rounds of follow-up interviews. So for 25 of them, we spent six hours talking to them about their lives. And that gave us a description of like what young people's lives were like. Most students didn't tell us stories about assault. They told us stories about sex. And uh, about 70 of the students that we interviewed told us stories of assault of the 151. And that's an important part of our project. We don't study assault independent of everything else. Instead, we put it in dialogue with sexual experiences. And to return to our bigger point or the overarching approach that we took, like we wanted to understand how the organization of sexual life on campus made assault predictable. Or, or just like, what is our sexual cultures today? How is it organized for different communities? And what does that mean for the experience of sexual assault? We also ran focus groups with 17 different groups. Um, so about 200 students and some were just whoever could show up at the time and, and others were all freshmen. Um, we had groups of people who all identified as women. We had groups of uh, African-American students, first generation and low income students, um, students who were religiously engaged. We ran different groups to see how students collectively talked about sexual assault. Then finally, we, um, we had uh, what sort of sets us a little bit apart was having a participant observation portion to our ethnography. And what participant observation is, it's like having people watch as, pe as uh, students' everyday lives unfold. So Jennifer and I did this in public places, like in on, at sporting events and in dining halls. And then we hired a group of researchers who we trained, who were younger than we are, and integrated into campus life. Um, and they went to fraternity and sorority events. They cooked dinner with students on Thursday nights and Friday nights. They went to religious services. They played on intramural sports leagues. And this gave us sort of a whole view of what it's like to be a college student today. And that really was the aim of the book, was to sort of pull back the curtain on the experience of being a young person today, and in particular being a young person at a residential college, and then to use that to try and explain why assaults were most likely to happen. Finally, the third big piece of shift was having a community transformation project. So Jennifer and I are deeply committed, as was Claude, to not just, and the rest of the team, to not just you know, producing research, but producing change. And so we, we had a vision for how the findings that we were developing could be leveraged to actually create change in a wide range of communities, particularly at Columbia. But the conversation today is also part of that, is helping communities use our design, our findings, and our insights to envision what change might look like in their own communities. You. So, and speaking about the book and all the different aspects of, you know, the experiences of sexual assault, you know, the book is centered around three big ideas, which are sexual citizenship, sexual projects, and sexual geographies. So, um, you know, you guys offer these as like a lens through which, you know, you can make sense of sexual assault. So can you share how these ideas interact with each other? Sure. So what I'll do is I'll return to the story that we opened with of Lucy and Scott. Um, well, first I'll explain the concepts, then I'll return to the story, and then I'll show how they interact. So um, sexual citizenship is the idea that people have the right to choose their own sexual experiences and that they need to understand that other people have that same right, right, to sexual self-determination. Um, and when talking about young people, it's honestly a little bit of a provocation because uh, in the book we argue that we can't solve the problem of campus sexual assault unless we stop trying to scare young people about sex and acknowledge that they have the right to sexual self-determination. Um, so, so that sexual citizenship, sexual projects is the question of what sex is for, which you might think is like the kind of question that only two professors could come up with because like, duh, sex is for fun, right? Except a lot of sex in college is not that fun, right? Um, and it turns out uh, 
you know, when we asked students what their sexual project was, that was not a question that they could answer. It didn't work out so well as an interview question. But listening to the stories they told us about the kinds of sex that they chose to have um, uh, or sought out, it was clear that for some students, particularly LGBTQIA students, sex was a way of figuring out who they were. Um, uh, for other students, um, sex was a way of connecting with other people, cutting across many different categories of, of identity. Um, sometimes sex was uh, just to accumulate experience, to sort of get rid of the stain of inexperience and, and you know, a perceived need to sort of catch up with one's peers. Um, not infrequently, um, among all kinds of students, sex was a way of trying to accumulate prestige or impress your friends. Um, so that's sexual projects. And then the third idea, sexual geographies, is um, the idea that space is not just a backdrop uh, to sexual interactions, but actually almost a third character in terms of shaping um, shaping how things unfold, uh, both on campus and off. So in the story that um, we opened with about Lucy and Scott, um, Lucy had a clear sexual project, right? She wanted to, as I said, meet some boys, make out, and eventually lose her virginity. Scott also had a sexual project, which was getting off. So in that interaction, um, he was totally oblivious to her sexual citizenship, right? He was only thinking about realizing his own sexual project. When he, when he said it's okay in response to her saying no, he wasn't just assaulting her, he was erasing her. He was saying you are a non-person because what you want doesn't matter because of what I want. Um, and then finally, sexual geographies um, draws our attention to how power is manifest in space. So think about the setting, think about them being um, in a building where he is surrounded by his friends, literally in the room that he sleeps in, um, and in a place where she is not in control. So you could certainly read that story as about gender-based inequalities in power. But if you miss the way those inequalities are not just about gender, but they're also about um, time on campus, right? So Scott is, you know, three years older, um, accustomed to how people act on campus, much more sexually experienced. And all of that is sort of knit into the space and expressed by that space. So the space itself is, doubly silencing of Lucy. So you, so the three ideas um, sort of together shape the experience. We particularly, in terms of um, thinking about driving change on campus, want to call attention to sexual geographies because perhaps the biggest power that university administrators have is, is reshaping the space on campus. It's very hard and I, I we would argue it's not really the job of an institution to tell people what kind of sex to have, right? And in the book, we're a little bit agnostic about what's the best sexual project. People should live their best lives, right? I mean, as a mom, I have an opinion about my kids, but um, as scientists, we're just describing the range of sexual projects. Um, uh, and But in terms of sexual citizenship and sexual geographies, it is the job of the institution to build geographies of equality, not just in terms of gender, but across all kinds of social difference, and to um, uphold and affirm not just sexual citizenship, but all kinds of citizenship. One of the fundamental arguments that we make in the book is that um, preventing sexual violence is, in, is inextricable from building a community in which everyone's citizenship is affirmed, in which everyone uh, feels respected and, and equal. So we can, we'll talk more about that, I'm sure, through the other questions. Thank you. Um, I really, I love this, this framework, this idea, like these ideas around like sexual geography, sexual citizenship, and sexual projects. I especially love sexual geographies because I think um, when you think about college spaces and like even like a dorm room, like there's just a bed in there. So if you're entering that space, that kind of like puts you in a vulnerable place. And I, I really love that, um, that it points out like the power that the space has. I think that's really impactful. Um, 
So another question we have um, is in the book, you discuss sex education as necessary for preventing sexual assaults. Can you talk a little bit more about what you learned through um, your studies about the importance of sex education? We have so much to say about sex ed. Um, you know, when we spoke to young people, and I, you know, I encourage the the students and and the you know administrators and faculty listening along to think about the kind of sex ed that they experienced um, in their lives. And and um, when we asked students at Columbia and Barnard, for the most part, about their sex ed, they they joked. Many of them made kind of the same joke, which was like, "Oh, you mean my sexual diseases course." because most of the sexual education that young people got was about the perils of sex, about all the terrible things that were gonna to happen to you if you had sex. And this was even in some of the best sex ed was like, here's the risks of sex. It's all about like, what is the risk of sexual activity? STIs or often referred to as sexual transmitted diseases and unwanted pregnancy, which I'm not even going to start about how heteronormative that is, the second one, but like, you know, we, we can see just how there's an erasure there of queer young people. And, you know, what Jennifer and I know is that this kind of sex ed isn't a natural way of doing sex ed. Instead, it's part of a deliberate decision for on the part of um, our political leaders to deny young people sexual citizenship and to turn sex into a problem. Or in the words of one of our uh, mentors, um, I'll name check Connie Nathanson because she deserves it. Um, Connie refers to this as, you know, the message that sex is a nasty, dirty, rotten thing that you should only do to somebody you love after you're married to them, right? And what that message does is it makes sex into a negative problem behavior. And that has real consequences. It has enormous consequences in denying two major things that we think are essential. First is a discussion of sexual projects, what sex is for, because if sex is a nasty, dirty, terrible thing that you should, avo you should avoid, everyone's sexual project should be sexual avoidance. And like Jennifer and I are agnostic about whether or not, like we think, if your sexual project is to avoid sex, either because you identify as asexual or because you have religious commitments that lead you to avoid sex, like you should avoid sex. Like we're very, very supportive of that approach, but we don't think that that should be mandated for everyone, right? And that it's almost impossible to have open discussions among young people about sexual projects with sex ed that looks like this. The second is that it doesn't just deny conversations about sexual projects, it shuts down any sense of sexual citizenship. Basically, the idea is that you never have the right to say yes to sex until you're married, which is like still not your right. It tends to be your partner's right to, to, to say yes to you having sex with them. And so that is a deeply uh, 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 disturbing way of denying the sexual citizenship of people. In the survey research, um, that we were a part of. We, we were not the leaders of that portion of the survey research. In a paper um, first authored by Jennifer's husband, John, John Centelli, I wanna give him a shout out for this paper. One of the major findings in that was that um, for uh, uh, women who had had um, comprehensive sexuality education that included practicing saying no to sex they didn't wanna have, they were half as likely to be raped in college. Now, in the social sciences, we never have effects that big. Like this is a hugely impactful lever that we have to help address sexual assault, and yet we don't use it. Often we deny it. Um, and so, you know, if you know, as 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 context, like when we were trying to set the guidelines for the COVID vaccine, we said 50% effectiveness would be the standard that we'd use. And so, you know, we've been very fortunate that the effectiveness of the vaccines that scientists have developed, um, kind of amazingly have developed, uh, are as effective as they are. But like, we have highly effective things to help prevent sexual assault. It's called sex ed, and we don't use it. And I'll just say, like, it's not about just teaching women to say no. Like, that's, um, it, that is not our point. Um, it's just the finding that we observed because it was something that people tried. We could imagine lots of other things like training people to listen for yes and um, you know, making sure that people practice inquiring. 
to take one big step back, I'll just say that like, you know, sex ed is part of the national landscape that frequently denies sexuality, but it doesn't just deny sexuality in general. It frequently denies sexuality for um, already disadvantaged or minoritized people. So for example, there are nine states in the United States that currently mandate that sex ed has to be homophobic. So it's not that like it just happens to be, it's literally the law that sex ed can never mention anything other than heterosexual sex. And so, so many young people felt erased by the sex ed that they received. And so what Jennifer and I propose in Sexual Citizens is um, you know, to return to our big point, like sexual assault on college campuses is not a campus problem. It is an everyone problem. And it is an everyone problem that is gonna require massive interventions. And that that consent education that we frequently provide in the opening weeks of campus is totally insufficient because it's like teaching calculus to people who haven't even learned arithmetic. If you don't know anything about sex, learning about consent isn't particularly useful. I mean, it's not useless, it's not harmful, but like we need to start somewhere else. And so what Jennifer and I chart a vision for is what community transformation looks like where sex ed, comprehensive sexuality education is something that's provided to people starting from their very earliest ages. And that if we do this, we can prevent sexual assault. But let me put this a different way. If we choose not to do this, we are choosing to have communities where sexual assault is more likely. That is, we are choosing organizations that promote sexual violence. And to do so, we argue is deeply irresponsible. Thank you. Um, me and Dina actually had a whole episode dedicated to sex ed experience in America because, you know, from our personal experiences, much of it was like anatomy. It was just our, telling us about our bodies, not really like the experience of sex or what our sexual project might look like. And actually, I didn't even know what a sexual project was until I read Sexual Citizens. And so I feel like this is really important information that would help a lot of young adults in their sex experiences. Um, and so in the book, you know, you guys tell us the story of a young man who realizes as he's talking to you that he had committed an assault. And so along with the need for sex education, this story and others in the book highlight the need for conversations about restorative and transformative justice. So also taking into consideration the calls to defund and abolish the police um, gaining recent mainstream attention. Can you speak more um, about these ideas and how we as a society should consider shaping um, sexual citizenship with the new set of values? Yeah, I mean, I think one thing that we have clearly learned from America's disastrous uh, experiment with mass incarceration is that it's not effective to try to punish, punish our way out of social problems. Um, and so, and I think that the focus on, um, throwing the book at them when people are found responsible in, in a campus adjudication process um, situates all of the, the cause of sexual violence in a person. And it sort of um, communicates the idea that if we can identify and um, discipline or expel the individuals that that will solve the problem. And in fact, that doesn't solve the problem because the forces that teach people to act in that way are still in place, right? And so we're not going to the roots of the problem. Um, the, the sort of the, the public health metaphor is, you know, you, you're at a river and you see babies floating by. And if you're a doctor, what you do is you jump in and you save the baby. And if you're a public health person, what you do is you walk upstream and you fix the bridge. Now, I mean, obviously they're like, babies are not falling in the river by themselves, but you figure out what is the system that is producing the babies floating by and you, you change it. And so that's, um, that's the, the take that we have on the, the sort of carceral approach to, um, uh, to campus sexual assault. And instead, um, as you suggest, we point to a vision of restorative justice where people who have experienced harm um, are centered in the process and where there's a sort of feedback loop so that people who are having sex in ways that hurt other people have an opportunity to learn to do better. The, the way that 
Um, our study was not primarily about adjudication, but we did learn that students have very good reasons for not wanting to report many of the assaults that they experience. And one of them is that mostly they're assaulted by people they know and care about, right? And frequently it's someone with whom they share an activity and they don't want to destroy what they don't, they're afraid that they'll destroy their friend group or that people will take sides against them. So the process that we have now ensures that there is no feedback loop, that it is almost impossible to let somebody who is hurting people through sex know that in a way that they can learn from that message. And so part of what a restorative justice approach would do is it would create you know, a victim center, a survivor centered restorative justice process would create an opportunity for people to tell the person who harmed them that they felt harm, for the person who caused the harm to take responsibility for it, and then for the person who caused the harm to, to learn not to do it again, right? I mean, like that is that that is the bridge upstream where the babies are falling in. And we currently have no oper very little opportunity for, for people to do that. I don't know, Seamus, if you wanna fill in anything there. No, I think that was um, great. I mean, other than to say that um, Sashi began with this account of somebody who assaulted someone in our interview and then didn't, didn't realize it. And I think that that also is an important part of the story. Like this was the story of Austin who was, really sort of compelling interview subject. And Austin had told us, um, I think the only really steamy sex scene in the book is uh, is with him. And uh, it was with him and his girlfriend on the 4th of July and um, they made their own fireworks. So we won't say more than that. And Austin was really committed to his girlfriend's sexual pleasure. There's a lot of evidence consistently about what's, what's um, frequently referred to as like um, the orgasm gap on college campuses and beyond which is, um, you know, and there's even cultural tropes about this, about the challenges of like women's sexual pleasures. And we'll just say that that is a cultural trope where people are committed to not being committed to women's sexual pleasure and have created elaborate justifications for that um, commitment and that that's part of inequality. And Austin, you know, was deeply committed to, to closing that gap. And he and his girlfriend had nicknames for the kinds of orgasms that she had while they were um, uh, together. And yet Austin told us a story about how early in his freshman year, he was so, um, he was really anxious about his lack of sexual experience. He'd come from a single sex, fairly conservative community, uh, high school, um, he'd been raised by women and so really kind of uh, respected women, at least in his own accounting. And yet he told us a story about how one evening um, his roommate wanted to have his roommate's girlfriend stay over the, that evening. And so they said to Austin, like, oh, just go sleep in my bedroom. So the roommate's girlfriend said to Austin, you can just go sleep in my bedroom. And so Austin, like, dutifully and in some ways out of respect to the, his sexual citizenship of his roommate and his roommate's girlfriend, like, the, their right to have sex, goes to his roommate's girlfriend's room. And when he opens the door to that room, his roommate's girlfriend's roommate is there. And she's sort of drunk. And she says to him, I don't want to do anything. Now, like, just take a step back and stop for a moment. Imagine you're asleep in your bed. Somebody walks into your bedroom relative stranger to you and your first reaction is to say I don't want to do anything like um, that tells you a lot about some of the dynamics and culture of college and Austin enters in the room and he doesn't listen to her and he got into bed with her and he started to touch her body and then he stopped himself for some reason and um, you know we don't know why he did uh, and he told us this story initially as a weird sexual experience. And later, um, he, in the interview, we asked him, so what's a sexual assault? And he said, well, it's any kind of non-consensual sexualized uh, 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 touching or behavior or activity. And at this moment in time, his eyes kind of welled up and he, he said, fuck me, like he suddenly realized, excuse my language, but we're quoting Austin in this instance, like what he had done. And it was hard for him to reconcile who he'd come to be as a young man and who he understood himself to be with the recognition that he had assaulted that woman. Um, 
And what this points to is a lot of things about how, you know, Austin basically had to figure it out on his own. Um, and through a series of experiences got to a point where he was a pretty responsible sexual citizen and pretty responsible with his partner, but like he didn't have any community guidance. And we could look at Austin and think what a terrible person he was, or we could look at Austin and think, wow, how did we make young men like Austin? And how did we make it so that they just had to figure it out for themselves rather than intervening in a different kind of way to create greater uh, uh, sexual citizenship? Um, I'm really interested in this um, idea of intervening in a different way. Like what are like these other ways that we can intervene? So like, I guess like in a, in a transformative justice sort of way, like changing the, the social, um, happenings that allow these things to happen but like do you have any other like interventions you think that could change these things from the start yeah i think jennifer and i have a lot of ideas for interventions you know the first is that we need to come at this from a position of empathy understanding and hope rather than fear so you know the book as much as it can be is a book that's written we hope with a kind of emotional register of empathy and a, um, a vision, a hopeful vision of what we can do, of the steps that we can take in order to create communities um, where all people can thrive and all people can um, realize their, their wants and desires while also respecting the people they're doing that with. Um, and, and so, you know, that's, you know, the, the, we, 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 instead of being like, be very afraid, be very afraid, college is a horrible, scary place, that's a kind of approach that doubles down on an understanding of sex as something that's grounded in fear and in shame. And there are real consequences to this. One young woman we spoke to told us that like drinking before sex was like Novocaine before going to the dentist. And what she meant by that was like it numbed her in order to allow her to do this thing that she kind of wanted to do, but felt so ashamed for having those wants and desires. And so our approach is kind of grounded in that empathetic understanding rather than fear, because we see the harms that fear can do. So let's be really practical. What are things that we can do? Well, Dana, you asked exactly about this before. Sex ed is essential and it needs to start young. It needs to start, you know, in some ways when people are infants. And um, it means that we affirm the wide varieties of identities that people can have. So um, that it's inclusive, uh, um, that it's grounded, not necessarily as Sasha, as you said, where you're like, it was all about the biology and of, of bodies rather than um, you know basic re human recognition and respect. And you might think like, are Jennifer and Seamus really saying that we need to instruct two-year-olds about sex? Well, actually, if they have questions about it, you should answer the questions in a respectful and normal way. But what we're talking about are lessons that we already give two-year-olds. Like, you know, if your two-year-old bites somebody, you don't just say like, well, I guess they're gonna be a biter for the rest of their life. What you say is like, hey, Susie, Johnny, like, we don't bite people. And like, you know, Jennifer and I have taught a lot of college students. We've yet to have a biter in our class. And it's because like communities intervened and made sure that there weren't biters anymore. We also convey to young people about the importance of respecting their own bodily space. And, and if they don't want people in that space, they don't have to be in it. And the necessity of respecting other people's bodily space. Don't grab, use your words. These are sexual assault prevention strategies that are really important. The second thing I'll say, and I bet, I think Jennifer will probably really build off this, is that like these strategies aren't just about sex. They're about fundamentally equality. And Jennifer and I are building off decades of just essential research, feminist research on gender and power. But what we're partially pointing out, and you know, so far our examples have been pretty much like in the binary and heterosexual, and I think we'll get out of that in, in the subsequent conversation, um, is like that equality is a sexual assault prevention strategy. That creating communities where people can thrive is partially about being committed to equality. And so some of the prevention efforts that we need to undertake 
beyond sexual geographies, um, which we'll, I'm sure we'll talk about as well, are interventions that are about moderating rather than augmenting existing power inequalities. And so this means building a broader tent of prevention where it's not just sexual assault prevention that we're seeking to do, we're trying to create equity within our communities so that that equity can be the foundational piece of our prevention strategy. Jennifer, I don't know if you want to layer onto that a little bit or. Well, I think, you know, as we've traveled the country on Zoom, uh, people want to know, like, what's the thing we should do? And um, we're pretty resistant to that question because there's no one thing that campuses can do that's gonna prevent all sexual assaults. The chapter one of the book, as you know, um, maps out how sexual assault is not one thing. And what that means is like, there's no one vaccine that prevents all infectious diseases, right? So like we, de we need a range of strategies. Um, when in the interviews for the ethnography, every single black woman that we spoke with, every single one had experienced unwanted non-consensual sexual touching. And so, an intervention grounded on being a good bystander or consent, those are important, but um, not gonna prevent those uh, instances of sexual assault because those assaults are about racism, right? And so you need to build alliances between people doing diversity, equity, and inclusion work and people doing sexual violence prevention to look at how those two things are, are intertwined. I think that our, our big vision of prevention includes thinking about the many um, unrealized partnerships or sort of under leveraged partnerships that could happen before campus. So that means bringing in families in a more robust way um, it means thinking about K through 12 education. You know, most children don't learn to read from their parents. Sometimes parents do a lot of reading with their children, but most children learn to read at school. Schools, you could think of them as like machines for forming humans, right? And like they have some sort of standardization so that like basically all humans come out the other end with some basic skills. And as, as Seamus was saying earlier, like we are very committed to under preparing young people for becoming sexually active. And so the absence of comprehensive sex education in school means that those human forming machines are leaving out a really important portion of um, something people need on the pathway to adulthood and something that we can't rely on all families to provide because not all parents want to step up and do that. But there are many other institutions that young that touch young people's lives on the way to adulthood. So, you know, the conversation around religious institutions and um, sexual violence has mainly been focused on making sure that their space is free of sexual harm, which like as a religious person, I have to say that sets a pretty low bar for religious institutions. Like really, if the point of religion is to teach people to be good people, like why not include sex in that? And then there's, you know, youth sports and camping, like they're every institution before college needs to be part of the solution. Um, I think about one um, young person, uh, gender nonconforming, uh, had never been out to their parents, um, talked about being assaulted before college, uh, they were enrolled in a summer theater program. And as they recounted it, it was their first seeing of queerness. And it felt like, like, you know, coming to the promised land, right? Like all of a sudden there are people who they felt included. They felt like it was like they found their people, right? Um, but sadly that was also a place where they were assaulted by an older gay man um, who uh, got them drunk and, uh, and, and assaulted them. And so, you know, you can think again, like that man is a terrible person. Yes, that man did, did a terrible thing, but also if they had grown up in a community that had affirmed them, if they had gone to a school that had a gay straight alliance, if they had been in a family where they felt comfortable um, coming out and like they would be supported for who they were, then maybe they wouldn't have felt so vulnerable in, in that theater space. So there are all kinds of, there, there's a whole range of things that we should be doing to build a world in which sexual violence is less common. Um, so there's not, there's not one answer, but there are many answers. <laughs>
So um, we're going to start the Q&A portion now. Um, so let me just look for the Q&A, sorry. So one question um, that somebody submitted was, when do you think we can start having the um, and they say that, I know you mentioned in the book that these conversations really need to start at a younger age, way before students get to college, but how can we start this process as a society? So so I think that there are, oh. go ahead. No, I was just going to repeat the question because Sasha, I think you froze and I thought that maybe, I don't know, Jennifer, did you, so I'll, I'll repeat the question just quickly because I'm hoping that people can hear it and then Jennifer, you can answer it if that's okay. So um, the question was, when do you think we can start having the necessary conversations about the three concepts referenced? In the book, you mentioned that these really need to start at a younger age, way before students come to college, but how can we start this process as a society and when should we do it? Jennifer. So uh, Seamus, what a good question. Um, so I think parents, uh, can have the sexual citizenship conversation with very young children without using the term sexual citizenship. When you say, as Seamus was saying, don't grab, use your words, what you are communicating to your child is that other people have a right to their, their bodies or their things. Um, uh, when you say, as I remember saying to my children a million times, like, when you talk to me like that, it doesn't make me feel like helping you. Um, what you're doing is you're instructing them about like, what is the right way for people to interact? Uh, conversely, like sometimes you see parents forcing their children to kiss relatives who they don't know or see frequently. Like that is an anti-sexual citizenship message. So there are all kinds of ways that in raising young children, parents convey messages about children's right to physical self-determination and the need to respect other people's uh, concomitant right. Um, the other way that parents convey a sense of sexual citizenship is by the words they use about body parts, right? Like if instead of vulva, you say hoo-ha or like any of the other absurd terms that people use, what you're conveying is that like vulva is not a sayable word, that there's like some deep shame in naming that body part. And so that conveys to young people that their bodies are shameful. If you like freak out as a parent when your child masturbates, then you're conveying to them that like they don't have a right to sexual pleasure, that that like, yes, not at the dinner table, but like, you know, it shouldn't be a shameful thing, right? And so, and anyone who's been the parent of an adolescent knows that that is, or, a child of any age knows that that is a part of um, learning about your body, is learning about the parts that feel good. So if you treat that as a normal thing, that is a very important um, acknowledgement of sexual citizenship. As your children get older, making sure that they have private time with a clinician where they can ask questions that they might not want to ask in front of you is another way that you can acknowledge your sexual citizenship. As they get older, making sure that they have access to inclusive, gender-affirming, uh, sexual and reproductive health uh, services is another way that you can say that you, you can communicate that you see them as emerging sexual people. And then finally, I'll just put in a plug for the sleepover. Um, because you know, pa many parents have strong feelings about the kinds of sexual futures and intimate futures that they imagine for their children. Um, and frequently it's an intimate future in which um, sexual pleasure it happens in a context of care and commitment and an ongoing relationship. And there's no more powerful way that you can do that, that you can communicate that, which is about a sexual project to your child, than by letting them do it when they're still under your roof. And so, you know, if the message you give your child is not under my roof, then that erases their sexual citizenship and teaches them that like 
the only sexual project that you desire for them is an absence of a sexual project, is a project of asexuality, which is a little bit unrealistic. Like that is not most people's sexual project. And so there's so many ways that parents convey messages both about sexual citizenship and about sexual projects without, um, without needing to use the words. It's part of, of, of raising humans and then sending them out into the world. And I know that for a lot of parents, they since they didn't get this from their own parents, they feel very underprepared for it. There are um, terrific books. I'll put in a plug for my friend Megan Madison um, has a book, a board book coming out uh, this summer about consent for very young children. And so I think thinking like people are producing tools to help parents have these hard conversations. I think that we acknowledge that not everybody grew up in a family that had these conversations with them. And so it's hard to start if you feel like um, you're underprepared for it. Okay, so I'm gonna kind of switch gears here, but you mentioned earlier that there is no single thing that we can do. Like, like people will ask like, what is one thing that we can do to kind of solve it? issue of sexual assault on campus. However, this, this question from one of our audience members asks, what is the biggest mistake that advocates and educators make when it comes to educating students on sexual violence prevention and what should they do instead? So I think it's a sort of far be it from Jennifer and, and me to say that like advocates are doing it wrong. Um, and, you know, I think that the challenge for advocates is not that they're just don't have the right strategy. And if they had a better strategy, they'd be more successful. It's that they're like constantly fighting a headwind that is like pushing very hard against them and are frequently underfunded, undersupported, and underrecognized. And so um, I, I will answer the question and suggest things that advocates can do. Um, but I don't want anyone who's an advocate now to like be like, oh, if I was just a better advocate, sexual violence would be over now. Um, because part of the um, point of sexual citizens, part of the, the aim that Jennifer and I have in this book is to say that, um, you know, sexual assault is an everyone problem. And what we need is to build really broad alliances where many people take more ownership over this problem and recognize that they bear some responsibility for, for addressing it so that it doesn't fall to the campus advocates and the Title IX group um, uh, in, on campus to address this. And I'll give an example of that, which was that over the course of our research, um, you know, Dana, you had said that you really liked the idea of sexual geographies. Well, one of the people that we had the greatest impact with was a guy named Scott Wright. I'm going to name check him because, you know, he uh, was the, I think, you know, he was the head of facilities and, you know, housing and dining services, basically, for, for undergraduates. And I suspect that for a while, when Scott was first involved in the project, he might have wondered why he was involved in the project, right? Like, like I guess this is a meeting I'm required to go to from the office of the president. So he, like, dutifully was there and was engaged, but, you know, at one moment in time, a light bulb went off in Scott's head. And it was when Jennifer was talking to him um, and Claude about space and how space was essential. That, um, um, Dana, you had actually pointed this to this um, example of like, you know, one of the challenges for college dorm rooms is that they typically just have four pieces of furniture, a desk, a bureau, a chair, and a bed. And I think Dana and Sasha, you were saying this was part of a conversation you'd had on your podcast. And like, um, you know, that if two people are hanging out at night, they don't have anywhere to go but a bedroom. And if they go to a bedroom, they have to sit on a bed together. And, you know, like it or not, beds have social meanings and that may not cause sexual assaults, but it also may determine a kind of future that both people maybe aren't fully comfortable with. And so Scott heard this and was like, oh, I could do something about this. Like, and he suddenly realized that like he could keep one of the dining halls open 24 hours on Thursday, Friday, and Saturday nights so that students had somewhere to go, or at least I think until like five in the morning. I mean, initially it was 24 hours, but I don't think anybody was there after 4.30. So like, um, you know, it, but he realized like he could play a role in sexual assault prevention and it was deeply empowering to him. And so I think 
um, I'll, I'll give two suggestions for the activist communities. The first is that um, uh, I would say that, you know, building broad based coalitions between uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion, um, uh, uh, substance use, and mental health services, and sexual assault prevention, like these are all four pillars of a common strategy grounded in equality that can like help mutually. So substance use, diversity, equity, and inclusion, sexual assault prevention, and mental health services. And like, I think that building those connections would be really, really important. The second thing I'll say is that um, if you take seriously the idea that uh, sexual assault is not a campus problem, it's an everyone problem, and if you kind of build on our insights that, and not just our insights, the insights of so many scholars who are doing so much important work showing that, you know, people who are assaulted are assaulted typically many times and that, you know, early experiences of assault are likely to lead to future experiences of assault. And I don't mean to scare people who've experienced assault many in the room, it, but it's just, it's something that we know. And, and so like, earlier intervention would be so important. And so I think, you know, so many campus activists are really focused on the campus. And Jennifer and I would push them to, to focus, I mean, on a broader problem and, and to really support, you know, one thing that they could really support as we talked about is comprehensive sex ed for everyone in the state that the campus is in. And I think college students frequently underestimate the power of their voices. Like politicians don't really wanna to talk to me and Jennifer, it's not that they don't want to, but like, you know, I think that if students um, from Westchester like called and talked to local representatives, they will listen to you if you make an appointment and advocate really strongly based upon extensive research of sex ed as having bipartisan support, which we know from a bunch of research in Guttmacher Institute it does, um, and that it's really effective for preventing sexual violence. Like, it is something you all can do. And I'll just point out that like, among women, we don't have good statistics for men, but among women who are of college age who are not in college, the risks of sexual assault are even greater. And so, you know, even if we do individual level change with our own communities, we're not going to have the comprehensive level change that we need. Think about a concept that we used to have to explain all the time, we don't anymore, herd immunity for sexual assault. You know, sexual, sex ed is, can get us there because even if we're very prepared as a community, lots of people outside of our community may not be very prepared and that puts all of us at risk. And so I would say also like, don't underestimate the amount of power that advocates can have right now advocating um, for state level policies for sex ed as part of a sexual assault prevention strategy. So I don't think people are doing anything wrong, but I think those two things, building broad tents of association and, and like in some ways responsibility and even empowering people to realize that there are things that they can do about sexual assault, even though they never imagined they could, and focusing earlier on state level policy could be very impactful for um, um, those activists who are already doing such great work on these issues. So um, I kind of wanted to touch on the topic again of, oh, I think my internet is messing up, I'm so sorry. Um, on the topic again of um, like pornography amongst like young adults. And so one of the questions posed was um, how does pornography impact this? Most people are using it, but it shows a lot of violence and degradation. A lot of guys I know expect those things too and want this aggressive degrading sex. My friends and I have had a lot of conversations about how much porn is ruining our sex lives. So, you know, just kind of like, what, what do you think like pornography has like an impact on the sexual lives of young adults? Yeah, I mean, we've built a world in which pornography is 
a major way that young people learn about sex. I don't know if any of you remember that scene in Booksmart where the two young women are on their way to a party and they're like frantically watching porn videos to figure out how women have sex with each other so that they can hook up with the people they're trying to hook up with at this party. And like, that's, um, uh, that really tracked with with what we, what we heard from young people, which is that because, um, the messages that young people get from their families are so frequently shaming and shutting them down when they express curiosity. And because they don't grow up in school communities where they can learn about sex, like porn, like we have chosen to let porn be the system of sex education, right? And actually it's not working out so great. So the question is, is really um, an important one. I think that it's, it's not too late at college for young people, and in particular for young men, to learn to be better at sex. Um, but there needs to be some, some resources there. So like I think sex positive programming that offers another set of ideals about how sex happens and what it means to be a good sex partner um, can potentially be a countervailing force. And the other thing that we love, um, Emily Rothman, who's at Boston University, has a critical porn education curriculum, which teaches young people to, because um, like everyone watches porn, right? You can't put the porn genie back in the bottle. We're not gonna say like, put parental controls on computers. Like I learned long ago that, in fact, I would tell you a funny story about that in a minute, but so you can't control your kid's consumption of porn. Um, but I think that what you can do is teach them to see how porn shouldn't be a model necessarily for the kinds of sex they want to have. It doesn't represent actual sex. They're paid actors with um, frequently unusual bodies um, doing things that might not actually feel good. And so uh, Emily Rothman's curriculum, which actually last week we were on a campus and we mentioned it and they were like, yeah, we're using it. So it's, I think, never going to be a thing that you see in high school, but it really could be a thing on college campuses as a way to sort of um, undo some of the damage of learning about porn through sex. And my brief story, which I tell with my son's permission, as long as I don't tell you which one it was, um, one of them got in trouble in fourth grade for uh, not following the school's uh, appropriate computer use policy. And I said to him, I said, I hope you weren't watching, watching porn on the school computer. And he said, no, that's what my home computer is for. So, and like fourth grade. So like really you can't shut it down. They're always gonna be one step ahead of it. I think all you can do is create an environment where as a parent, you um, counterbalance whatever they see online with um, more egalitarian pleasure oriented messages about sex. And um, I think as an as a, as a, um, institution of higher education thinking about uh, applying those critical thinking skills, which is after all, one of the big points of higher education to being a, a thoughtful consumer of porn. I also wanna just briefly layer onto this, if I may, um, you know, as Jennifer said, like, you know, the, the challenge with porn is that it, it's, it's partially, it's where people are learning about sex. And so one thing is to focus on the bad part of porn. The other is to focus on the bad part that that's where they're learning about sex and like say, what are we giving them as a counterbalancing thing? But I think one other thing that we might raise here is that we said this before, but it's sort of important to note that it's, um, we haven't really created systems for people to get feedback about the kinds of sex that they're having. And in Sexual Citizens, we don't just talk about sexual assault. We talk about a wide range of sexual experiences, some of which are very harmful to people, but that like aren't assault, right? Uh, but, but, that, but that people don't really have the capacity to talk through. And so some of the challenges of the silence and shame around sex isn't just the challenge of assault, but in the question that the person asked, they were like, you know, there are all these guys who want pretty violent or aggressive, maybe they don't think they said violent, I think they said aggressive sex and that it's ruining their sex lives. Like one of the challenges that we'd identify here is um, that like uh, that 
there's that there we haven't created mechanisms or comfortable ways for people to get feedback on the kind of sexual partner that they're being. And so one of the things that we might try to imagine is like, what are the community level processes or interventions that would allow for something like that? That like guys could get feedback in, in this particular context to be like, hey, this isn't pleasant. Um, maybe don't do it this way. Let's talk about other ways that this can be a mutually pleasant and beneficial experience. Okay, thank you. Um, we have another another audience question. Um, this one is, the book talks about, quote, a toxic brew of whiteness, masculinity, wealth, and power. Can you talk a bit more about the vignettes related to that? Absolutely. So one of the chapters is called The Toxic Campus Brew. And what it does is it interrelate, interrelates, um, as you've just said, whiteness, masculinity, um, substance use and power. And um, the point of that is not to say, oh, just like guys are terrible, uh, white guys, white heterosexual guys are terrible, but to highlight a few really important things about drinking culture and campus life and why it is that that tends to be um, sort of uh, something that we need to address. And you know, I, I think when Jennifer and I started writing this book, we didn't imagine that we were going to write a book about masculinity, whiteness, and um, uh, uh, um, you know, power. But we ended up having to do that. And so let me let me say if, tell a few things. Um, it's not that white people are the only people that drink, but the campus culture, drinking culture, is inexorably tied to cultures of whiteness. And um, as evidence of that, so like Jennifer wrote, like always bring the receipts, um, white Americans across the board drink significantly more than other ethnic and racial groups. In particular, they drink significantly more than Black Americans, than Asian Americans. And that's not to say that Black Americans and Asian Americans don't drink, but like drinking as a culture is often deeply a white practice, but it's not just a white practice. It's also distinctly a male practice. Um, men drink way more across all ethnic groups, almost all ethnic groups, I think. I don't, I don't wanna say all because I could be wrong about some ethnic subgroup, but they, men drink more than women. And drinking is frequently part of an experience of power on campus. Um, now, in order to illustrate that, let me just tell quickly the story of Carl. Um, Carl was an African-American man who told us quite explicitly that he didn't have drunk sex and that he didn't have, um, it, not only was he never drunk when he had sex, but he wouldn't have uh, drunk sex with women and particularly with white women. And Paul expressed a deep concern about false accusation, which was a false accusation of sexual assault, which was a very consistent concern among the men that we spoke to, um, a concern that far, far outstripped the actual risk of false accusation. But it's important to recognize that like these men were very sincere, if descriptively wrong <laughs> about the frequency of it, of being falsely accused of assault. And it's important to, like that's a real part of their experience. But for most men, they, they just kind of like still get very drunk and have sex frequently, not always, but frequently. Um, but Carl was unwilling to do it. And um, he told us a story about meeting a woman at a party and um, she wanted to go home with him, but in his assessment, she was too drunk. And so he spent over an hour walking around the area around campus with her so that she would show, sober up. And eventually they went back to his room. And when they got back to his room, he still refused to have sex and spoke with her for still another hour until he finally assessed that she was sober enough um, to have sex with. But the story doesn't end there. At the end of the encounter, um, after they'd had sex, Carl told us that he made a recording, of an audio recording of her saying she'd had a really good time. And he didn't just make the recording, he then told us that he had done research. So he looked up what the standards of evidence in New York State were, and discovered that New York was a one-party consent state. And what that means is that 
uh, audio recordings made without the knowledge of the other per person are admissible in court. So he knew that he could use this in his own defense. For Carl, this was like part of, and he described it explicitly as such, the experience of being a black man in America and the experience of feeling like the justice system was not a justice system for you. It was actually an incarceration system seeking to target you in particular. And it deeply influenced his practices of drinking and of sex and of hooking up. And that is sort of the undergirding of that insight that doesn't actually feature in this particular chapter, it features in a later chapter, but like of the insight of that chapter, which is that, you know, we need to address drinking and sex as a commingled part of culture. And we can't do it in a way that says you can't drink and have sex because drink, people don't just drink and then happen to have sex. They frequently drink in order to have sex. Remember the Novocaine story I told you about the woman who said she got really drunk so that she could allow herself to have sex. If we tell young people you can't drink and have sex, they're going to hear that as I can't have sex. And, and so we have to like have a broader set of conversations about this, tying drinking to risk and how drinking makes you at risk of committing an assault, not necessarily of being assaulted, but also of committing it because you don't read social cues, you are slow to respond to all kinds of things, you don't act in the ways you normally would. This is what drunkenness does. Um, uh, but more generally that we locate that conversation in a broader conversation about whiteness and masculinity and um, how those are intersecting and augmenting forms of power that actually frequently put white men at risk of harming other people. And that's the kind of conversation that we'd love to have. So um, our next audience question is, can you discuss how peers influence sexual experience as the, sexual experiences as discussed in the book? Um, the short answer to that is a lot. Um, and uh, let me tell some illustrative stories. Um, so one young woman um, who actually came in to be interviewed because she was so distraught um, about uh, having assaulted her gay best friend and wanted to talk about it, told us a story that was not a story of assault, but from her, from freshman year, she was running with um, what felt to her like a, a pretty wealthy and fast crowd. She came from a, um, a, not, a not such a wealthy family. The money that she brought to campus, she brought from working um, at an amusement park over the summer. Um, which is not the kind of job that rich kids have. And um, so with this crowd, they would, as she described to us, they would go out for brunch on Sundays and spend like, in her words, like $1,500 on champagne, which was probably an exaggeration, but I think reflects how she felt about them, that they were just overflowing with money. Um, and she felt a little bit out of depth, not just economically, but also in terms of the kinds of guys that they would hook up with. A big um, part of these Sunday brunches was passing around their phones and showing who they had hooked up with the night before. And so one Saturday, um, she found herself at a party uh, in a suite um, where the team captain uh, of a, um, a men's team uh, live with his friends. And as she said, like he pulled some alpha male shit because all of a sudden everyone left the bedroom except for him. And um, he sort of instructed her to take off her clothes and they had sex. And then he handed her clothes to her, like dismissing her. And then as she left, she saw that his friends had been outside listening. So like not an assault, but a disgusting experience, right? Kind of degrading. Um, and yet and she told us the story, not just as a bad story, but also as a moment when she had a good chip to play the next day because he was pretty hot. He was a guy that like people wanted to get with. And so passing around her phone, um, you can see it's a moment where her sexual project was, um, uh, demonstrating prestige. She was showing the girls in this brunch crew that she was their, their social equal. Um, so, you know, and that's just one example of how peers shape 
the way that people interpret sexual experiences. There's another story in the book um, of a young man who was so excited about having hooked up with this girl in the library stacks. Like that felt like a really sexy experience to him. And then he told his friends about it and they were like, she's gross. Like it, it wasn't that the sexual act was not impressive to them or the scenario was not interesting, but they felt like she was socially beneath him, not attractive. And so the experience went from being something that like he thought of as hot to something that he thought of as a little bit of a social failure. So you can see where people read sexual experiences through the ways that their, their peers interpret them. Now, in terms of the relevance for understanding campus sexual assault, I think the thing that people are afraid of is that people um, will share a story with a friend and the friends will be like, you were assaulted. And mostly what we saw was the opposite, that, that, that young people share stories with their friends that feel uncomfortable to them, or as, as um, they say, kind of rapey. And if it's shared within a social group, mostly what we heard about is what we would call downgrading, where an experience that to us, as we, heard, as we saw it depicted, was clearly an assault, would be interpreted by the group as gross or um, mean, but not necessarily assault, to maintain social harmony. Um, so there are all kinds of ways in which um, the sex that happens between two people is actually something that is, is part of a group. That chapter, we initially were gonna call it group sex. And then I think that sounded like funnier than, than what the chapter was about. Um, but that's, that's part of what's missing in the campus conversation around consent. I don't know if any of you have seen the T video, but it just features two people. And in fact, there are forces all around um, those two people who are actually having sex that shape both how consent is practiced and how it's how it's understood. So um, that's a little bit from the book about how the peer group uh, shapes uh, sex and sexual assault. Okay, I do I do want to mention it. It is 129. I want to be mindful of everybody's time. Um, I just wanted to thank you guys so much for coming out. It really means a lot to us. I know me and Sasha and our other co-host of the, the podcast who can't unfortunately be here today. Natalia, I know this is very important for us. We're all very excited about it. Um, but I just wanted to know if you guys had any final thoughts or words or anything to close. Um, I, mean, I, I just want to say thank you for being such wonderful interlocutors. It's been great to be in conversation. And, you know, it's so important for us as scholars and authors that um, people take up and engage the work. And it's not about just sort of like, you know, adopting it whole scale, but using it as part of your own critical and investigative practice of your own communities to say, how do we think about our projects and this kind of citizenship and these geographies of experience and equity and power and apply this um, uh, to our own institutions and communities and beyond. And we're so thrilled to see you and um, you, know, Dana and, and Sasha, thank you so much and everyone else around you doing it. So it's it's been a real pleasure to be here. I just I just want to echo Seamus's thoughts. It's pretty. I'm going to tell my mom about the podcast. Now we feel like that's feels super special. And um, just so Dana and Sasha and Tess and Cindy, like stay in touch and let us know what let us know what happens. Like it's it's thrilling for us to see that the book feels meaningful to you, and we want to hear the next chapter. We want to know what what kinds of changes you make on your campus. And um, it's just such a such a nice birthday present for me to to have been in conversation with you. So thank you. Thank you all so much. Yes. Happy birthday. <laughs> thank you. Okay. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you so much. You're welcome. All right. Thanks, folks. I want to say thank you again to Dr. Jennifer Hirsch and Dr. Seamus Khan. And thank you so much to Sasha and Dana for facilitating this conversation. Um, I'm now going to end this portion of our keynote and we will move on to our bonus uh, session now. Thank you. Uh, thank you again, Dana, Sasha, Tess.
Dr. Hirsch and Dr. Khan for that uh, really insightful, thoughtful conversation. Um, at this point, I have the real honor and pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Justin Sprague, who will be joining us to, uh, to share a, a, a very powerful piece. Um, Dr. Justin Sprague has both a PhD and an MA in Women's Studies from the University of Maryland, College Park, with concentrations in critical race um, slash ethnic studies and food studies. He's also earned an MA in Humanities and a BA in Communications from Old Dominion University in Nor Norfolk, Virginia. Dr. Sprague's research examines the functions of authenticity as a mechanism for racial identification and ethnic identity construction. Censoring the cultural narratives of Korean Americans, he examines what bodies and identities are considered authentic in a given racial group or ethnic community context, how the concept is constructed and in what ways authenticity is moderated through the vehicles of food and mother work. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Sprague as he shares his essay, Learning to Shout. Hi everyone, and thank you. Um, I'm unable to start my video, so um, if somebody could restart that for me, there we go. Hi everyone, and um, thanks for sticking around with me here today. Uh, I'd like to take a second to thank the Center for Women and Gender Equity for inviting me, and also for hosting this amazing conference. This is wonderful. And a special thanks to Dr. Sandy Alcedonis for reading my words, then reaching out to me, and making a seat at the table for me. It's a really amazing form of solidarity, and I really appreciate it. So for a little bit of context, what I'm about to read to you, it began simply as a statement decrying anti-Asian violence and racism for the Women's and Gender Studies Department here. But really what this turned into, with the support of my colleagues, was a really cathartic and deeply personal reflection on history, racial violence, position, positionality, and the silences that we endure. So this is a love letter to my Asian and AAPI community, but also a call to action for all of us. And so I lastly want to offer a quick trigger warning as there are a couple mentions of racial violence. So please practice some self-care when listening. So this is a story about learning to shout. So it was the early 90s in Nebraska, and each week our teachers would ask one of the parents to read their child's favorite book to the class. My Korean mother, who was also the school nurse's aide at the time, was very excited to read my favorite book, and I couldn't have been more ecstatic to have her read it. It was a book about a young boy who builds a spaceship and travels to each planet in the solar system, and it was so colorful and it was the best ever. And at that point, my mom could do no wrong either. She was strong, incisive, protective, and her skin had the most beautiful brown glow. Often maligned by other Koreans for her dark farmer's skin, I saw nothing but a beautiful radiant goddess, wanting to be just like her and to maybe someday be half as beautiful as her. A mama's boy growing up, I lived most of my early years peeking out at strangers from behind her legs because she was my protection. She had a sharp tongue, quick wit, one hell of a stink eye, perfectly painted nails, and fabulous fashion sense. She had that kind of inherent style, grace, and confidence that only women of color exude, and that white people would try their best to appropriate in about 20 years time. It had become a family legend that when my brother was in a baby stroller, that a German shepherd charged at them, and in all of her maternal rage, she barked and chased the dog down the street to protect my brother. She has a winning sense of humor, lovingly joking that I was born queer and that I'm so sensitive and artistic solely because she spent her entire pregnancy eating ice cream and reading Harlequin romance novels in order to learn English. And when a band teacher wouldn't let me play the piccolo, she marched right into their office, calmly closed the door, and she shared words, and I got to play the piccolo. When people would harass me and called me names in the street and in stores, she would simply squeeze my hand and lift my chin. My father would listen to her intently, loved her with all fibers of his being, and he praised her often for her strong will and iron constitution. And he still pretty regularly tells the story about the way my mom roughed him up when they first met at a skating rink in South Carolina in the 1970s, because she mistook him for someone else, proceeding to pick him up by his shirt and scream at him. And he says to us that that was the moment that he knew that he'd marry her. And they've been married ever since for more than 40 years. She's a pillar of strength and fortitude, the quintessential immigrant woman who worked hard, raised a family, and somehow never forgot her worth. 
So when she came to my class to read my favorite book, I was filled with so much pride. All of us students sat down in the corner of the room looking up at her in her chair as she held the book out to read. And as she began reading, within moments, my classmates began to imitate her accent and started pulling at the corners of their eyes. They started laughing at the way she pronounced words, and their laughter became deafening and uproarious as they looked between my mother and then to me, and then to me, and then to my mother. I remember sitting on the floor, willing myself not to cry, turning beet red, holding my breath, and counting the words until my mother would stop. Suddenly, I never wanted to read this book again, and I didn't after that, and I just wanted my mother to disappear. So for the first time in my life, the strong and infallible woman I knew seemed to melt away right in front of me. Rather than being the strong-willed, fierce, and sharp-tongued woman I knew, at that moment, the queen before me had faded, and she chose to ignore what was happening rather than to confront it. And so instead of inquiring about why this happened, because deep down, I knew why it happened, I misplaced my feelings of pain and rage and publicly humiliated my mother, getting so angry that she couldn't say the words right. So for some time afterward, when kids would imitate her, I'd laugh with them. When neighborhood kids would open up our kimchi fridge that sat in the garage and it was filled with Korean food and ingredients and they would scream, ew, or gross, I'd close the fridge really quickly and change the subject. I would crassly correct her when certain English words came from her mouth. I started to turn my nose up at the delicious Korean foods she would cook for us. I tried so desperately to wash away the color that she gave me, to rebuke the wisdom she imparted to me, and to deny the lineage of strong Korean women I'd come from. The woman I'd held as my paragon of strength and authenticity was now just a voiceless Korean woman, but by my own design. I tried so desperately to blame her for my own racial suffering without ever stopping once to think about how she suffered in that moment or in the many, many other moments in her life that she was dehumanized at the hands of racism and white supremacy. So it took me years to recognize where to file that memory, how that story operated in the narrative of my life, how something like this could happen and where that experience fell in the larger landscape of North American racism. While pivotal to my understanding of my own raced self, in the grand scheme of racism and the way I'd encountered it, discussed in mediated or educational spaces, I was constantly told that these experiences didn't feel racist enough to warrant discussion or liberation. I was fed lies about model minorities and made to think that because of my, pro my own proximity to whiteness, that the atrocities and hardships I faced were my fault, rather than the flawlessly executed mechanics of white supremacy. I was never educated about the numerous uprisings of the AAPI or the Asian American and Pacific Islander community throughout the 1970s in Chinatowns across the country. I was never educated about the Chinese railroad worker strike in 1867, protesting unequal and inhumane labor conditions, becoming the largest labor strike of the era. I was never educated about the Oahu sugar strike, demonstrating an early form of Asian solidarity of various communities throughout the broader Asian diaspora. I was never educated about AAPI participation in the liberation struggles for other non-AAPI communities. I was never educated about the legacies of Asian activism and solidarity occurring for hundreds of years throughout US history because a model minority myth is predicated on erasing those histories. It's predicated on severing those relationships built on mutual solidarity, minimizing those struggles and rendering our relationship with racial violence all but invisible. I was never educated that we have had a voice and for generations, but like a good and model Asian, I fell silent. And subsequently, my silence toward my own oppression and the oppression of others within my own community allowed those outside of the community to remain silent to my oppression as well. I suffered alone and now I knew why my mother, as strong as she was, also suffered in silence. When we consider the domestic and racially motivated terrorism that claimed the lives of six Asian women, or the brutal attacks on Asian elders, or the countless microaggressions related to COVID-19 that have emerged within the past year, it's very easy for us to imagine that this form of racism is new or novel or even temporary. The uncomfortable reality, though, is that this racism has deep roots spanning hundreds of years. Systemic anti-Asian racism has been institutionalized and normalized repeatedly throughout US history, often situated contextually within watershed moments. 
the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882, the Immigration Act of 1924, the internment of Japanese American citizens in 1942, repeated yellow peril imagery throughout the 20th century, contemporary mediated portrayals of Asian immigrants as docile, silent, and exploitable workers, while their second generation children are represented as desperate to assimilate and desperate to abandon their communities and traditions for white spaces. These are just a few of the many ways that Asian American and anti-Asian racism permeates our culture, our laws, and our history. But part of learning these histories, though, comes with the critical need to have the sometimes uncomfortable conversations as well. See, we can and we do experience racism. We can and do experience suffering. We can and do experience the deep roots of white supremacy, but we experience them while simultaneously participating in a culture that also rewards anti-Blackness. See, we cannot decry injustice without also looking inward to identify how our own communities benefit from anti-Black racism. White supremacy operates at its core through anti-Black racism. Our suffering as AAPI operates through the mechanisms of Black suffering. And as a byproduct of white supremacy, anti-Blackness has and continues to lay the blueprint for all racism. The ability to render us eternal foreigners is facilitated in part by the brand of nationalism that emerged throughout and after the enslavement of Black people and the genocide of Indigenous people. Our racist positioning as the model minority is predicated in part on our willingness to engage in structural anti-Blackness and to turn a blind eye to racism and systemic violence against the Black community. The sheer audacity exercised every time Asians are told how we should feel about racism and whether the crimes against us are indeed racist and racially motivated are directly informed and shaped by the white supremacist tactics learned through generations of rhetorical pushback against Black liberation movements. When the white media focuses on Black criminality for our suffering, like it did when reporting the damage to Korean businesses during the LA uprisings in the 90s, yet failed to address the way that that suffering, and in many cases, the examples of surrogate whiteness that was applied to AAPI during Asian and Black conflicts by a white judicial system, how that's fashioned by and because of white supremacy, this becomes a story told through the lens of anti-Blackness. When the countless times that Black and Asian unity has taken place over the course of decades as a form of mutual empowerment is not in the news, but singular and individual conflicts are magnified and sensationalized to divide these communities are in the news, that tactic is rooted in anti-Blackness. When white media establishments tweet articles about how Black people can be strong allies to Asian Americans right now, instead of stories like how white people can work to end the structures of racism that they created, regardless of whether the articles are helpful and well-intentioned or not, we see that it is an act of division or the reminders of past divisions that are put in the center of conversations about BIPOC solidarity. See, focusing on how someone else should be Black and present rather than examining why you are white and absent is predicated on a history of anti-blackness. Part of knowing our histories in the US as AAPI also means acknowledging the systems that that hatred and racism exist within. The only way to truly combat white supremacy is to recognize how it affects all communities of color. Liberation and justice for us cannot happen without liberation and justice for all BIPOC communities. And being earnest and accountable opens that path toward justice for white people working in solidarity with us. White supremacy is squarely your creation. Thus, it is your responsibility to address the root of the problem. Gone are the days where you can blame someone's age, the context of their upbringing, or the fact that they're having a really bad day for the things that they do or say. Because whether or not you do or say racist things yourselves, you are still directly implicated in what your ancestors created and from what you continue to benefit from. Simply choosing not to use racial slurs or choosing not to appropriate another culture is not enough to combat white supremacy. For non-Black people of color, it is our job to examine and decry the ways that anti-Blackness is deeply entrenched in the values of our own communities and to address those parts of as our path to liberation. Only by doing so are we truly seeking justice for the AAPI community. So like Amy Tan suggests in the Joy Luck Club, our voices have a certain magical quality to them. And when we learn to shout, when we realize that our voices carry with them all the good intentions of our foremothers, we can move mountains. 
It's a magic rooted in our ancestors' suffering, ancestors who cast spells to protect us from the systems that tried to swallow them. Our magic is, in part, a kind of resilience that we shouldn't have to exercise as we do, yet somehow we always find within us each and every time a white supremacist has a bad day. Our magic is in the voices that bellow from within our stomachs, filled with the food of our ancestors. But that magic works best when it's used to protect each other. So while we in the AAPI community are learning more and more each day, each generation to shout for ourselves, let's also remember to use our voices to shout for and protect the Black community, who have always been the first and many times the only ones to shout for us, to hold our hands, to protect us. Let's use our voices to shout for our indigenous family whose histories include genocide and the theft of lands, resources, stories, and even their children in the name of US nationalism. We must shout to protect our Latinx family, many of whom share convergent immigrant narratives with us while being treated as less than citizens or as disposable. Let's remember that our struggles as BIPOC may look different, but our magic is the same. While we rally to be heard, while we exercise that magic in our voices, remember that we must also shout to uplift those impacted by the same structures that enable the continuous violence against our elders and ourselves. So as I look back on the moment my mother read the book to my elementary class, I see myself sitting on the floor in silence, choking on my words and holding back tears as my mother's beautiful accent was ridiculed by my classmates. I've since repented for pushing her away, coming to terms with the fact that I'll carry that shame with me for as long as I carry her eyes in my head and her sway in my step. But at that moment, to see my mother suddenly become human, to see the impenetrable fortress I knew and loved become rendered a silent statue in the face of racism and ridicule was absolutely devastating unable to step into the fray to protect her. We were both inevitably bound by our silence. And for a long time, I was filled with the guilt of the many other silences that pervaded my own lived experiences, like being called out of my name and not confronting the people who do it, being denied service or treated differently at establishments and not demanding to speak to a manager, being harassed with racial and homophobic slurs by law enforcement and choosing to simply shed tears in silence being told I'm simultaneously not American or white enough or not Korean enough and choosing to just ignore it, being told any one of the many racist dog eating jokes and then being told to lighten up when I find them offensive, being told that I'm one of the acceptable ones because I keep my head down or being used as a number for diversity headcounts yet being treated as if my experiences don't matter when I speak out about systemic racism and then subsequently retreating with my tail between my legs. In all of these moments, and in learning about any one of the almost 4,000 reports, not including the many that surely go unreported, of anti-Asian violence and hatred, I'm triggered thinking back to another moment in elementary school when I was grabbed by a group of white boys, held down, and whipped with switches until my back and legs bled. When my father marched me up and confronted one of the boy's fathers, showing him my injuries, he simply responded with a blank stare while I just stared there crying in utter humiliation, in silence. The sad reality is that my experiences in the 90s or my mother's experiences in the 70s, they're not unlike the stories of many other AAPI in 2021. And my heart breaks anew for my extended community each time a new experience of racial violence emerges. My heart bleeds from the experiences we've all held on to in silence. But my mother needs me now. Our elders need us now. We need each other now. Our stories need to be heard and we deserve to tell them. So it's time for us to shout. Thanks everyone. Thank you, thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. Um, Dr. Sprague was kind enough to share the full text of this beautiful piece with us. Um, and it's been posted to our um, resource hub for this, um, for the conference. And so I invite folks to reread the, te the text and to let the words uh, wash over you and to, to, to really wrestle with, the, um, with everything that, what, that was shared with us. Um, included also in the text are additional um, social media links as well as other uh, resources for folks to learn more, donate, and continue to contribute to this meaningful work. And I can't think 
thank Dr. Sperg enough for sharing that with us um, and making space in, in your schedule to be with us here today. Um, as we come to the end of our time together um, for this opening session, I wanna thank everyone who stuck um, who stayed with us for the entirety of this time period, who engaged in all of these meaningful conversations. I invite you to reflect on what you heard here today um, across all of the sessions and to find ways to make, uh, make meaning of it and to implement it in your, um, in your respective communities. As we close out this session, I would remind folks that um, this is a full two-day conference. And so our next session will start at about 2.15. Um, and that is uh, that session is titled Consent, Sexual, Social, Professional, and Beyond. It's a student-led panel session on the concept of consent. Um, thank you again, everyone, for joining us this afternoon. And I, like, I look forward to being in conversation with folks throughout the course of these two days. Have a wonderful day. On the screen right now is the QR code um, for folks who uh, need to uh, let us know that they're here tracking their attendance or need to verify uh, their attendance for things like uh, extra credit. Um, and so go ahead and scan that if you if you need it. Um, also in the chat is a link to the um, hub for the conference for the links for all of the remaining sessions as well as additional information related to the conference. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a wonderful rest of your day. And I look forward to seeing all of you at 215.